Uh, we are be continuing a series that we started about baptism. And uh, this series we're calling Ripple Effects really talks about what are the effects of being immersed in the life of Jesus. And today, given all that we've talked about already with our uh, needs to minister to the international families, it's appropriate that today that we talk about what it means, uh, the ripple effect of being a part of God's family, that, that being immersed in the life of Jesus means not only that we are a part of his family, uh, we're a part of a new family, but that we're a part of a different kind of family. Uh, you know, if you think about initiation rites, if any of you have ever gone through initiation rites before, maybe it was something when you were in college, you joined a fraternity or sorority, and there was some kind of an initiation rite, or maybe you were a part of some sort of guild or a trade group, and there was a ceremony to uh, bring you into that. Every, most people who have been married have gone through the initiation rite of a wedding ceremony. Um, if you want to be an attorney, you have to pass the bar. Um, and even today, you can see many times if families are adopting children, they'll have an adoption party or a ceremony where the child is adopted, formally adopted into the family. In the ancient Roman world, um, it, it, adoption was different than it is today. Uh, the ancient Romans would often wait until a person was a young adult before they adopted them. They kind of wanted to see how the kid turned out, whether to dis determine whether or not they would uh, give that kid their name and, and, and inheritance as part of the family. This was the mindset and mentality uh, of uh, the, the writers of the New Testament. When they talk about being adopted into the family, they weren't thinking about going and, and adopting an infant or a small child. They were really thinking about this idea of an adult being adopted into the family of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul said this in Galatians chapter 4, 5, and 6. We have been adopted, talking to other adults who are believers in Jesus. Here's a ripple effect of what it means to be immersed in the life of Jesus, that we have been adopted into his family. We are no longer slaves, but we are now sons and daughters. Isn't that amazing? It wasn't just that we were orphans, as if that wouldn't be bad enough, but he says we were even slaves. We, we didn't even have uh, the freedom to choose and do for ourselves what we would want to do, and we have gone from that state of being slaves to being adopted in to the family of God. That is an amazing, amazing effect of what it means to follow after Jesus. That we are immersed in to Jesus. We're brought into his family. Several weeks ago, we talked about uh, baptism as a sign of believing. That, that a ripple effect of following Jesus is that it changes the way we believe. Baptism is a public act of obedience, proclaiming an inward commitment of faith. And then last week we talked about baptism as a sign of becoming. That, that a ripple effect of living in Jesus means that it changes who we are becoming. In fact, we said, you know, in life as we know it, you start with a birth certificate and you end with a tombstone. But in, with life in Jesus, you start with a tombstone and have a birth certificate. We're buried with Christ in death, that's the tombstone. And we're raised to walk in a new life. That's the new birth certificate we have as we are becoming like Jesus. Baptism is a sign of our lives, that our lives are being changed from the inside out. It's not just of what we believe, but it's who are we, are, we are becoming in Jesus. So today as we continue, I want to talk about baptism and how it is a sign of celebration. A sign and celebration of belonging to the body of Christ. A beautiful celebration that we belong to something. A ripple effect of our faith is that we are baptized into the family of God. And it is not just any ordinary family. In fact, it's a radically different kind of family. Now we're going to look at a passage of scripture today. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open to Acts chapter 10. And I love this passage of scripture. It's one of my favorite passages of scripture. And it is especially appropriate today as we look at our church's international ministries and how the family of God is so much bigger than just the color of our skin or shared DNA or the languages we speak or the countries from which we come. It is much, much bigger than that. And I want to look in this story at two particular men, two different men. One is on the inside. One has an inside track. One would already be considered a part of the family. And the other person is an outsider. The other person is an other kind of person. 
One is a Jew and the other is a Gentile. And of course, we've talked for, for many weeks over the, over the course of several years about how Jesus came for the others. That Jesus came into the family of God. He was a part of the nation of Israel who always considered themselves to be God's chosen people. But when Jesus came in, he reminded them that God's mission was never for them to be an end in of themselves, just a family unto themselves, but rather to reach out beyond themselves, to be a light to the nations. That Jesus came to reach out and reach the others. Now, this message was strong with Jesus, but it wasn't quickly adopted by his followers. And interestingly enough, 2,000 years later, sometimes we in the church have a hard time adopting this idea and this, this ministry as well. Jews had become so isolated and separated from the Gentiles around them. There, there was this distinction. There were the insiders who said, hey, we are the circumcised. We have been set apart, and we are, we are part of the circumcised. We are part of the chosen family of God. And then there was everybody else, and never the two were brought together. But there were many people who were not a part of God's chosen race who were faithful and obedient to what they knew about God. And one of those people was a man by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius was not a Jew. Cornelius was not a part of the family of God. But listen to what, listen to what Luke says in Acts chapter 10 about this man named Cornelius. Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 6. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known of the Italian cohort. So he's a military leader. He's a very powerful and influential p person in the Roman military. A devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to people, and prayed continually to God. So we already know something else about Cornelius, that he believed differently than the rest of his Roman friends and family members. That he believed in the one true God. The Roman uh, Romans had many gods. They practiced emperor worship. They, they, they worshiped a lot of the, the different pagan gods uh, of the time. But something was different about Cornelius. He worshiped the one true God. But it wasn't just about what he believed. It was also about what he was becoming. Because notice, his faith was exercised in the way he treated other people. That, that he gave generously to people. And he prayed. It wasn't just what he believed. It was what he was becoming. About the ninth hour of the day... He saw clearly in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Isn't that, isn't that interesting? Here this man is. He's never been circumcised. He's never followed any of the Jewish laws or customs. He, he's probably never observed the high holy days. He's He's never been to temple. He's never made the sacrifices. And, and yet, his act of obedience, based on what he believed, just in simply being generous to the poor and in faithfully praying, it got God's attention so much that God was speaking to Cornelius. He, he, he didn't necessarily speak to the Jews of that day. There were many Jews who probably had never heard as clearly from God as Cornelius was hearing from God. Do you know today in the Middle East, there are stories that are coming in off the mission field about how hundreds and hundreds and even thousands of people living in the Middle East are having dreams about Jesus. Very clear and obvious dreams about the gospel. God is using his church to reach them, but God is also not waiting on his church as his spirit is just inspiring people to have revelations about who God is and to see something in Jesus. This is what was happening to Cornelius. And now, God is saying to Cornelius, and now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. Now, this is the same Peter who was uh, one of Jesus' disciples. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. Now, what we see in this passage is that Cornelius was a good man and that God did take notice of Cornelius' goodness. But do you also see something else in this passage? It wasn't good enough that Cornelius was good. It wasn't good enough that he gave his money to the poor. It wasn't good enough that he prayed. The Holy Spirit of God knew that Cornelius needed something else. There was something lacking. And so through God's love for Cornelius and, his, and in his desire to reach out to Cornelius, his spirit tells him to go to Joppa and get Peter. Why? Because Cornelius, as good as he is, 
still doesn't know the good news about Jesus. He's not aware of it. Somebody needs to tell Cornelius. And so the Holy Spirit says, hey, go send messengers and find Peter. Now, meanwhile, Peter is at this man's name, this man, Simon the Tanner's house. And uh, there is a, a, a lot going on, and he's waiting for a meal. And Peter is hungry. He is waiting up on the roof for the meal to be served. And uh, meanwhile, he has this vision. And in this vision, he sees this giant sheet being lowered from heaven. And in this sheet are all kinds of, all kinds of food that, that a good Jewish person doesn't eat. Lobster and, and shrimp and bacon. Can you imagine not being allowed to eat bacon? Aren't you thankful for Jesus? We, this sheet comes down and, and all this delicious food is there, but, but Peter is not supposed to eat any of it. And, and so the Spirit says, Peter, have some bacon. Have a shrimp sandwich. And Peter's like, no way. I have never eaten this. I, I've never eaten it. This is all unclean. I'm not allowed to eat any of this stuff. And the Spirit says to Peter, don't call unclean what I have made clean. Now, now this is a, a radical departure from the Jewish law. I mean, this is something that Peter's mom and grandmom would have been appalled at. Any good Jew would have absolutely been repulsed by this. But God was speaking to Peter. And he was saying, I have made all these things by my hand. And by my hand they have been made. And they are good. And they are worth being redeemed. Now why was this message so important for Peter? Because God had just told Cornelius to send messengers to Simon the Tanner's house to get Peter. And God also knew that Peter, being a good Jew, was not very likely to want to go to Cornelius' house. Why? Because Cornelius was a Gentile. So God, out of his love for Cornelius, was also preparing Peter to do the work that Jesus had called all his disciples to do. You remember, when, when Jesus called his disciples and said, go into all nations, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Isn't it interesting? Jesus had already planted the seed, but still there was an apprehension to step outside of the boundaries of the people who are like us. There was still apprehension to reach beyond those good Jews who had followed the law, people who looked like me, acted like me, thought like me. And so God sends this message to Peter. So Peter, Peter receives these people coming and asking, hey, will you come to Cornelius' house? And Peter immediately recognizes what God's telling him to do. So Peter goes to Cornelius' house, and he arrives at Cornelius' house, and we pick up the story in verse 35. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. Truly I understand God shows no partiality. But in every nation, Anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. Now, I'm not sure who had the greater revelation in this story. Cornelius, who heard the gospel for the first time. He had heard that God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son into the world. That whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the whole world. Cornelius, you, a Roman. That God so loved the whole world, the people living in the jungles of Asia, the people who are along the Amazon River or the Nile River, the people living in Africa, the people living in China, the people living in the cities of North America. That God so loved the whole world that he sent his only son. I don't know if Cornelius was more amazed by this or if Peter was more amazed at the magnitude of God's mission and what he was being called to do in establishing a new kind of family. That these two people who had before been separated and isolated by their race, by their language, by their religious backgrounds, by their biology, by their heritage, suddenly these two people who had been so far apart are brought together as one. Listen to what he says in verse 43. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through the name. 
You see, here, here's what Cornelius needed to know. It wasn't enough just to be a good person. It, you need to understand and recognize the forgiveness that is possible through Jesus Christ. And that is a message that must be shared. As good as Cornelius was, he couldn't have known the good news of Jesus without Peter going to share it. Because good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Good people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. Cornelius' good works were not enough to earn his forgiveness, but his faith in Jesus Christ were. Passage goes on and says, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people? There it is. Now you notice ESL is mentioned in this passage too. They were speaking in tongues they didn't know. Why were they doing that? Well, because there were foreigners there. And God supernaturally gave them the ability to understand the gospel in their own language. This is why the ministry of ESL is so important. It's not because we want to make people Americans. As much as we want to welcome people to, into citizenship, if that's what they choose, it's, it's not just as much so that they can get a job, but it's so that they can hear the gospel. It's why we want English teachers to go to the Korean campus, because we are losing the next generation of Korean if we're not able to share the gospel with them in their heart language, which is not the Korean language, but it's English. If you've been here for any length of time, you've seen the full circle now. We had to figure out how to share the gospel with the Korean in their language, and now we're having to figure out how to share the gospel with their children in English. But see, this is what the point is. This is what the Holy Spirit was doing through his church. It's what the Holy Spirit is still doing through his church. And then, and then this idea, well, why don't we baptize them? Why don't we bring them into the family? Isn't that a ripple effect of what it means to be immersed in the life of Jesus? That we're all a part of this family. So Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain for some days. So Peter's question here, what's keeping, what's keeping us from baptizing them, really tells us that this was a groundbreaking moment in church history. Prior to this, uh, most scholars think that only Jews had been baptized. Only Jews who had come to faith in Christ had been baptized. But Peter just stepped outside of the box and has now baptized a Gentile. See, God did not limit himself to just the circumcised. The Gentiles were included, and their baptism indicated that the Gentiles were included. They belonged. There is no distinction in Christ. You belong to him, and therefore we belong to one another. I know in our culture today and in our world, especially in these last few months, we, we try to identify people by all kinds of different ways, by their sexual orientation or by their color of their skin or the country they're from, and we seem to subdivide ourselves more and more and more and more, when in fact the gospel says we are one in Christ Jesus with beautiful distinctions that should be valued. And yet, in Christ Jesus, what, what draws us together is so much greater than anything that would divide us. Galatians 3, 26 and through 29, For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons and daughters of God through faith. For as many of you, as here it is again, were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is no male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. See, baptism is not just a religious ritual that indicates, hey, this person has become a believer in Jesus Christ. That is true, and it's beautiful. And baptism is not just a, a symbol of what you are wanting to become as the old you is buried and a new you is raised to life. That is also true. But it also is a beautiful symbol and picture of our adoption into the family of God. That we become one. 
Baptism means you belong to a new kind of family. A family known, a, not, a family that is not known by its ethnic heritage, but by its common faith. A family that isn't marked by the appearance of our flesh, but by the condition of our heart. Romans 2, 28, 29 says, A person is not a Jew who is one only outward, nor is, nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is a circumcision of the heart by the Spirit. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, The Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the hearts of your descendants, so that you may love him with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your life. You see, the external ritual, as beautiful and as important as that might be, it's not as important as what's happening on the inside of us as we recognize our membership in this family. That the ripple effect of our life with Jesus means that you're my brother. You're my sister. That means something. That I should weep when you weep and celebrate when you celebrate. That, that even though we may not know each other, we, we may not have history together, we are immediately united in the family of Jesus Christ. Jesus said this, that, that all those who follow him would be marked or branded by their love. Look what he said. Look what Jesus said in John 13, 34. A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, so you also should love one another. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples. That you've been baptized. That you show up at church, that you read your Bible, that you give money in the offering plate, that you volunteer. No. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples, that you love one another, that, that we're branded and we're marked by the love we have. This is what the world longs for. This is what the world is aching to see right now. When, when we have to remind each other that certain kinds of lives matter, it's the world crying out for a new kind of family, a family that is only found in Jesus Christ. A family that is only found when we can just look beyond what we see with our eyes and we look deep inside of what unites us in our hearts, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus was branded. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. But Jesus was branded during the crucifixion. His scars were evidence of his love for us. When he appeared to Thomas after the resurrection, Thomas, of course, missed the first meeting of the disciples that Jesus had with him. And he showed up the next time and said, I won't believe that Jesus is alive until I see the scars. And the resurrected Jesus showed Thomas the scars and invited him to place his finger in the hole where the nail was. And, and we're, told in, we're told in Revelation that even, even in glory, the scars will still remain. Why is that true? Why does Jesus still bear the scars? He, he, he still bears the scars as the lamb who was slain. Why? Because they're, they're a testimony of his love to us. They're a testimony of his love for you. I love that line in the hymn, crown him with many crowns. It says, crown him the Lord of love. Behold his hands inside. Those wounds yet visible above in beauty are glorified. Baptism. Baptism is a beautiful sign that we belong, it's a celebration that we belong to the family of God. I hope and pray that maybe you will, you will come and join us on August 22nd for the beach baptism. Uh, you can sign up, there be, we'll share a meal together, it's a boxed meal. Uh, if you, we need to know that you're coming so that we'll have enough food for you, but also if you are interested in being baptized, you, you want to formally declare your membership in this body of Christ, we would love to welcome you on the 22nd and celebrate what God is doing in you through baptism. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads and pray with me. Father, we come today and we are grateful to you for the beautiful testimony of baptism, not just a religious ritual, but a, but a mark and a sign that we belong to a new kind of family. And Lord, it's a, it's a family that our world is longing for. And, and I pray that as, 
as your people, as members of your family, that, that like Peter, we might be stirred out of our complacency to reach beyond and outside of our comfort zone to welcome others into your family. And Lord, for those who have been on the outside of the family who want to come in, Father, like Cornelius, I pray that you would inspire and move them, put them in circumstances and situations where they can hear the message of your gospel and that they would be welcomed into the family. Lord, we thank you for the gift that you've given us. We thank you for the opportunity to come to you, to come even as we are, that we might be changed by you into the image of your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. My name is Lauren Carlucci, and um, I grew up in the church. I was saved at an early age. I did get baptized. Um, it was at a church in the baptismal tank in front of the whole congregation and everything. And um, at that time, I think I just thought it, this is the thing you do. It's like you, it seals the deal. This is, you know, um, it was definitely more of a religious act to me than it was anything that I really understood. Um, when I got older and I rededicated my life to the Lord, um, I, well, it was a very different experience in the baptism because it wasn't in the baptismal. It was in the ocean in November during a nor'easter. <laughs> so it was a lot different experience, but I, I understood it in a new way because I remember going down into the, there was a huge wave that came up behind me. And I remember going down and being buried with Christ. And then it was like the wave just engulfed me. And I just felt like the love of Jesus surrounding me again. And then coming up and it was cold, so I definitely felt new. <laughs> um, but I think that that to me, it was like, it marked a new way of life for me. So rather than it just being a religious act, it was more um, like a, a symbolic, um, I was sort of saying to the world, like, this, I've, I've died to my old ways and this is my new. It was like a marker in my faith, in my walk and journey as a Christian. Um, through a series of divine appointments, um, I began a discipleship process and um, decided, you know what, doing things my way is not working, so let's just try things God's way. And I got involved in a student ministry at my college, and I just fully devoted my life to the Lord and um, finally had some lordship in my life and some spiritual disciplines. I started praying and reading my Bible every chance that I got. I remember sitting outside my college class reading my Bible, and then I would go in, and um, I remember this one girl in that class. We ended up in a study group together, and she told me later on, she said, I saw you like walk in the class, and you just you were like glowing and she was she just knew that there was something different about me so if somebody was wanting to maybe take that next step and get baptized or um, surrender your life to Jesus there's a reason that you, that you're at this point and that you that you're even considering giving Jesus a try and it's because following Jesus is um, to me, it's like the only way to live. <laughs> I didn't, you know, didn't work my way. So 